Welcome back to the Go Training. This is module 4.2, Contact Tracing and Case Finding. So the objectives of this module are, like many of our other modules, threefold. By the end of the session, you should be able to characterize basic features of contact tracing within overall role of surveillance. You should be able to describe how contact tracing can stop Ebola transmission, and you should be able to give examples of how your work, regardless of why you are deployed, can contribute to contact tracing. Are we ready? Here we go. There are certain principles of Ebola control that I'd like to talk about right at the beginning. Now, community engagement is something that must be done across all areas of Ebola response. So that's the first fact to establish. The other three pillars are very closely linked too, and the one that we're talking about in this module falls under the control of transmission. What does that mean? We are trying to stop the transmission from person to person in order to bring this under control and to stop unnecessary death and suffering. And in the control of transmission, there are some key things that we do. Case detection, case investigation, contact tracing or monitoring for 21 days because that's how long the incubation period is and the interruption of uh, transmission. All right. So this is all in one area. In another module, we're going to talk about safe and dignified burials. And in a previous module, we already talked about case management. And this graphic is just to put the three together so you can see that they're very close and they're very, very uh, interlinked. Now, if we go to the key components of Ebola outbreak and surveillance, and you would have already heard, even if you're not working in surveillance, that there is a lot of work going on in this area. And there are some big steps which actually flow from each other and relate to each other. The first step is about alert. So it is all about the work around being alerted that there could be a suspected case. And that's done in many ways, and we'll talk about that. The second is when we've been alerted that somebody may have Ebola, we do something called case investigation. The third is, once the investigation has started, the next logical step is contact tracing. So we need to trace the contacts of someone who may have Ebola. And then once we've identified those people, uh, those contacts have to be monitored for 21 days. And in the next few slides, we're going to go through each one in more detail. So don't worry if this is a lot of information at this point. Step one, alert. Information from the community is directly picked up by or indirectly routed to the surveillance teams. And how, how does this happen? Hotlines, you'll see in, men, in the Ebola affected countries, there are hotline numbers and people call in. There are events and there are rumors that we pick up. There are deaths and that is a big, big signal that Ebola is in this community. Contact monitoring. So of previous people who may uh, have Ebola, we monitor the contacts and then that becomes an alert for us. People, some people self-report. And of course, laboratory diagnosis, that alerts us that this is an area that we need to work in. Information will be communicated to the surveillance team to assign epidemiologists and train surveillance officers to conduct case investigation, which is the next step. So what is case investigation? Case investigation is interviewing a potential Ebola, a person who may potentially have Ebola, and this is called a potential Ebola case, to decide if he or she meets the case definition and to obtain epidemiological information. For some of you, the, this may be new words, so I'm going to go a little slow here. So, an Ebola case is referring to a person who may have Ebola. So the case refers to a person. A case definition is a set of criteria that allows technical experts to understand if uh, this person has Ebola, is suspected of having Ebola, or is confirmed of having Ebola. Now, what is asked in this investigation? Interview. There is an interview and personal information and where they come from, how old they are, whether they're men or women, if they're a man or a woman, this is all recorded. The symptoms are recorded and what we call exposure or risk factors. Have they had direct, indirect contact with somebody who may have had Ebola? The previous contacts that person has had and the interview also identifies others who have come into contact with this 
person. And this is called contact line listening. And this is the way to find new contacts. Case investigation informs the next steps. So should this person be isolated and have access to medical care? Should a specimen be collected and sent for laboratory testing? And then the whole process of contact tracing. So you see case investigation is very important. This leads to step three. The main rationale for contact tracing and monitoring is depicted in this graph. See the blue box. Contact tracing and monitoring leads to early detection. Uh, early detection has two areas that we need to care about. One is if you detect early, there's early treatment and the patient has a greater chance of survival and being accepted back into the community. Uh, the second thing is if detection is done early, there is early isolation. And what does that mean? We reduce the transmission from that person to other people and therefore bring the outbreak under control. So this is the rationale for contact tracing. Now, we've used the word a contact. In a way, this is a technical term, but we have to remember a contact is a person. But a contact is someone who has lived with someone who has Ebola, is the case, who has visited somebody who has Ebola. Who and where the case was visited is important. All health facilities the case visited. All persons who have come in contact with, with someone or a body at the time of death or afterwards. Uh, also, if someone with Ebola has been in markets, schools, offices, healthcare centers, work, or in some recreational uh, environment, they can also be a contact, and anybody else. So you see, it's very, uh, it is quite a challenging job to find everybody that somebody with Ebola has come into contact with, a case has come into contact with. So there are three basic elements of contact tracing. The identification and follow-up of persons who may have come into contact with a suspected, probable or confirmed case with the ultimate goal of detecting and isolating new cases as soon as possible. This is the point of contact tracing. All right, this is the purpose. Now, where are the three steps? Contact identification. Contact tracing begins with a case, somebody who is suspected or who has probable or confirmed with having Ebola, all right? The second step is contact listing. Informing contact takes tact and empathy. Remember that, so if you're identifying somebody else in the circle of contacts of someone who has either suspected, probable or confirmed Ebola, we have to use tact and diplomacy and empathy to actually inform they may be exposed. And priority has to be given to high risk categories of contact and experts can tell you who they are. And then the third step, once we've done the identification, the listing, we have to go to the contact follow-up, and some people call this monitoring. So we monitor for 21 days after last exposure. Can you remember why 21 days is important? It's important because 2 to 21 days is the period in which we know somebody who is infected starts displaying symptoms. And after 21 days, if symptoms are not uh, exhibited, we know that this person doesn't have Ebola. Um, all of this work is coordinated by the epidemiological surveillance officer who works with supervisors who manage contact follow-up and teams. And again, all of this has to happen with proper community engagement and participation. Now, if I take you to contact identification, it's very important to remember there are things that have to happen before identification can happen. The people doing it have to understand the strategy uh, for contact identification, and this can change from place to place. So if you're going in to do this kind of work, remember that you will have pre-service training in order to understand the strategy and the methods that are being used where you're deployed. We need community and individual engagement and compliance. If people are not forthcoming or they hide uh, suspected, probable or uh, confirmed cases, then this is going to be a very, very big problem. We need, therefore, regardless of your area of training, you're an epidemiologist, uh, you're a technical expert, you need to have excellent interpersonal and communication skills and really to have very, very good cultural awareness and adaptability. This is a very, very serious issue. And also not to forget what else is required to start contact tracing. 
we need a comprehensive line listing of relevant contacts. We need the personnel. We need transport. We need fuel. We need commitment and perseverance. And again, the community has to be engaged, supportive, involved. Contact monitoring, the last step as I said, last 21 days, because that is the limit of the incubation period, is intended for early detection and new cases. So if you're monitoring people who may have been exposed, that is a great opportunity to detect new cases, people who may have Ebola very quickly. And we call this active case finding, or it could be those people self-report. More sustained efforts are required at community level. Districts to gather data on several on, on uh, overall progress, and this is done daily or weekly. Supervisors to oversee day-to-day -day monitoring activities. Communities and c contact monitoring personnel, and really often these are volunteers, are often on their own. So all of this requires a lot of support, a lot of coordination, a lot of help, a lot of understanding. So you can see a contact self-initiated report, one symptomatic, goes to the contact tracing and monitoring staff or volunteers. So this is how this happens. And this graphic really summarizes some of the things that we've said and looks at the link between contact tracing and case management. And I'll leave you to uh, use this as a summary slide to sum up all the things that we have said. So really the model is very, very, very simple. The tactic is simple. A public health worker or a volunteer, and there's a goes to the contact. So it's a very simple tactic, but there are big challenges. All right, let's talk about some of those. Surveillance activities and community engagement. Community support to initiate surveillance work is key. Willingness to accept workers into their communities. The level of resistance and obstacles, fear, denial. We know in all three countries this has been a problem. This has been a very, very serious problem. Community engagement to facilitate and enhance continued surveillance activities so that it doesn't drop during the time that is required to keep up this vigilance. So a proactive approach in ca active case finding, voluntary reporting in a timely manner, and anticipating and resolving conflicts effectively. These all have to be done. Problem identification and solutions um, for the overall response, it often starts in this area of work. So what are these big challenges? Challenge one is that contact tracing, active case finding can require a lot of resources, an extremely heavy workload. So a case investigation form is three pages long because we need all this information. It can be spread out over a wide uh, geographical range. There can be difficulties with diagnosis, so there can be sort of non-specific symptoms, or there can be poor laboratory capacity. So unless all these things work at each level, the whole system cannot work. Urban areas affected in this outbreak is very different from remote villages where we can do contact tracing much easier. And there's high mobility of populations. So it's very, very difficult to find this large number of contacts. And we talked about logistics before. You know, you can have all the personnel and the form and the knowledge as you need, but unless you can reach these communities with vehicles, with fuels, with security, with everything else, it's going to be almost impossible to do this. The second set of challenges is really about the local context. So how can we adapt surveillance and contact tracing standards to the local context? When there's localized transmission, it's a lot easier to use the model that we have. But when we have intense transmission, there's so many contacts and they're so difficult to find. This model is, can be challenged. Again, we said if the person with the uh, suspected probable or confirmed Ebola was from a remote village, a rural village, it's much easier to identify, to list, and to monitor the contacts. But in urban areas where people are crowded, there are large numbers, a lot of contact, and they are mobile, it becomes very difficult. Also, data management is a, is a challenge too. Unless the information is complete and of the right quality, it becomes very difficult to analyze it and act and have actions based on that. Insufficient use of innovative technology, for example, mobile phones, um, to actually uh, gather information, to process it, and to report it real time, can, needs to be stepped up.
And sometimes we've seen in this outbreak this very unclear data flow. So if you're working in this area, you will get training, but these are things that you need to think about. If you're not working in this area, think about how you and your work can intersect with some of this. The third set of challenges is really about the social, cultural context of the communities we're going to work in. Religion, culture, politics, others. You know, traditional practices. Do we understand them? Do we understand the reason why communities are resisting the good sense advice that we're giving them? Do we understand people's perceptions, emotions, fears, angers, their previous views, how they view advice given by their own governments, political views? So all of these actually impact enormously on whether people bring forward their sick, admit to being a contact, uh, stay and re keep reporting to the contact uh, monitoring team to, so that they can be monitored for 21 days. All of these things actually impact this. Building trust with communities takes time, but it is essential. Um, and, and here I've, I've just mentioned that we've had uh, the consequence We've seen the terrible consequences of not paying enough attention to this. Several, there have been several episodes of violence against surveillance teams, and there have been instances where teams have been killed. So this is something that we really have to deal with. So here we are, going very quickly in this very important area of work uh, of contact tracing, active case finding, and the three areas are here, alert, case uh, investigation, contact tracing. So here, you know, here are some of the ways that some of the other uh, areas of work can contribute. ETUs, and that is sort of summarizing giving care, so case, uh, case management. Lab, that's a diagnostic. And in the, in the event, in the tragic event that somebody actually dies from Ebola, the burial, the safe and dignified burials. As you can see, these are interwoven. So what I'd like you to do now is to take a few minutes, as has been the practice at the end of all of our modules and submodules. I'd like you, you to list how your work uh, during your deployment, how you think it can relate to or contribute to the work in case finding and contact tracing. So how your work contributes to or relates to directly or indirectly to case finding and contact tracing. I hope this has been a useful session. I will see you in the next one.